I hope everyone had an enjoyable lunch. Um, session four is risk assessment case studies. And Dr. Laura Lyman Rodriguez, Anastasia Wise, Kelly Kelm, and Jeffrey Seidman are going to walk us through three case studies, in hypothetical case studies, involving risk assessment for IDEs. Um, and now we have Dr. Rodriguez. Thank you, Christina. And if I can invite the panelists to go ahead and come on up to the table. So this is the interactive portion of our programming. Um, so the success and value of the next hour or so um, is going to be highly dependent on um, everyone's involvement and from online as well. Um, please send in questions. We have. Um, worked to construct some case studies to help us think about some of the things that we've heard about this morning and, and do our best to um, put our own thinking caps on and think about how we would make different decisions and then talk about um, those the issues that that raises and where we might have um, come to different conclusions and thinking about the individual scenarios. Um, so I guess one thing that... Um, I guess I was curious about, and I'm not sure how many people we have on the web now, but I'm hoping that everybody that was on beforehand um, also came back from lunch, um, and we will just get going. So the task here is to um, not to make predictions of here's a set of facts and this is exactly what will happen. As we heard about um, this morning from FDA, um, the determinations are very much based on the device and the specific ways that the device is being used. And so the case studies that we're going to talk about are hypothetical, and they are meant to be a thought exercise and just an exercise. Um, so we do hope that they'll be useful, um, but they are, are something that NHGRI worked to put together, and, and so they represent just that, um, our thought exercise. Um, we made some assumptions about different things um, that we put forward as study design. Um, some of you may think that they're not quite realistic or that in reality, they would look a little bit different. Differently, we tried to make them um, pretty realistic, but we were also trying to pull out certain points. Um, and so sometimes we let that creativity be a little bit more of our guide um, than what we might expect to find um, in the laboratory. Um, so just to get started, we'll move on to the first one. I guess I can use this. will be a little bit easier. So protocol X. Um, I'll just walk through first what the, the basic parameters are for the study design. So 100 healthy newborns enrolled in a um, NGS um, screening program using whole genome sequencing. Pathogenic results are confirmed by Sanger in a CLIA certified laboratory because the results are going to go back um, to the participants. Um, results that will be shared include non-medically actionable um, conditions with a, a childhood onset. Um, that will be reported to the parents. Um, also, the study design calls for returning um, medically, medically actionable adult onset um, conditions um, to the parents of these children as well. Um, also, within this study, there is an aspect of it that includes um, doing sequence analysis of the parents of the newborns who are being screened. So there's a trio analysis to this looking um, and in those trios, the pathogenic variants um, that are de novo I don't, will be um, returned if, if the parents consented to receiving the um, findings based on the ACMG guidelines for the ACMG 56. Um, if so, genetic counselor will be um, available and can provide services before and after testing. Um, and that is where we stop, so I can go back to this. So before we get going, based on this, you can take a few more minutes um, to look at it. I actually read through it to give everybody time to read faster than I can talk. Um, but I want to just start our, our interactive session by um, asking everybody, just at the, set, at the outset before we go through any of these further, um, how many people, based on what you've heard this morning, based on what you bring into the room, think that this would be a non-significant risk determination? If you were making the determination, would would do make a non-significant risk determination for this study. And how many um, would make a significant risk determination? 
And how many are abstaining? There's some that <laughs> That's true. I did not give the choice of exempt. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> how many would Mark get exempt? <laughs> <laughs> okay, you'll go with exempt? Okay, thank you. And I hope everyone online also um, voted for yourself to have this in mind as we um, walk through some of the case. What we're going to do now is sort of um, highlight some of the aspects of the study design that we think are relevant to the considerations that we've heard about this morning. Um, so first of all, um, the device here um, is the, of course, next generation sequencing testing. That's not a surprise. That's what we're here to talk about. Um, and so, um, again, as we heard this morning, just to reiterate this, the device is everything um, to go from the specimens to the results. So it includes um, reagents, consumables, instruments, software, um, everything that we've talked about as part of that pipeline. Um, Another point is that um, the results here, in this particular case, we, we have chosen to put forward this orthogonal confirmation um, by Sanger for pathogenic results. Um, and in doing this, as we heard this morning, this can um, be a way to have an alternative um, way to confirm um, the next generation sequencing information. Um, but we still have um, issues to think about with regard to false positives and false negatives. Um, it's also then important as well to think about um, the analytical validation data that would be important to come in um, to support um, this going forward. If the ID request was submitted to the FDA, um, they would certainly want to see that kind of data um, along with the submission. Other factors that we thought were relevant um, to be considered here um, were the fact that here, as you'll recall, we're talking about screening healthy newborns. Um, also, we're in, in doing the screening, they're being screened for disorders that they wouldn't normally be screened for. So this is a difference from standard practice. Um, also, of course, as genomics is struggling with generally outside of the context of, of just conversations about um, IDEs, but there are risks associated with returning um, results here. And as we heard a lot about this morning, the FDA in particular is, is concerned about um, the false results, so false positives or false negatives, and what the consequences might be of returning um, either one um, of those forms of errors in the data. And, and then, um, in particular, thinking about what the consequences of returning information that may be a false positive or a false negative um, could be. So that's something that's relevant to thinking about um, the risk attached, again, to the specific trial in terms of what's specifically being tested for and what the specific um, implications could be in that scenario um, if someone either received um, a false positive and pursued treatment accordingly or did not receive um, information um, based on a false negative, and again, maybe perhaps didn't pursue, um, pursue treatment that might have been um, recommended. Another aspect that is included within the study design is something um, that can be relevant to thinking about the overall submission for an IDE would be the fact that it, um, the inclusion of a genetic counselor in the course of returning the results um, to um, be a resource for the um, patient participants. So let's see, we have a few other things that we wanted to highlight, and then we'll go back to the interactive um, discussions. Um, again, thinking about the um, aspect here, including the testing of trios and the return um, to parents of if assuming that they consent to receive the information of incidental findings relating to the ACMG 56 um, and what implications might be for that. So now, based on this information, um, our posit was like the majority of the room, um, that 
um, this protocol would likely be significant risk. And so based on that, I'd like to ask the, our FDA colleagues um, to see if they would agree with, with what we put forward and if, if they wanted to speak to any of the particular reasons um, why or, or issues to call out and we can have any questions or discussion about um, the, the things that we, we raised here as well. So I guess I'll start. Um, I mean, I think our concern is the return of this information um, to, for healthy newborns. Um, you know, I think it's obviously not very typical right now for you to sequence healthy people and return results. Um, you know, most of the experience that we have is obviously with someone who has signs and symptoms, family history, that is being sequenced for some purpose, and then, um, you know, that's initiating, that just that phenotype initiating the sequencing, uh, and we understand, obviously, there's recommendations from ACMG on incidental findings, but I think our concern is the return of results um, for a healthy study population. Did you want to add anything uh, to that? No, or? I have the same concerns. Okay, someone from... The audience want to ask a question, and and we are just to, to clarify. We have a few minutes to do this, so we'll we'll go back and forth with the dialogue, and then there's some other points that we sure. might draw out. But. The way how the the scenario was described is that the sequence will be confirmed by another process or another sequencing. So not being familiar with the disease in question, if you look at the exemption criteria, in order for study to be exempt, it has to be non-invasive device, which this would be the case. Non-invasive sampling, I assume it's just blood draw, does not introduce energy, which would be assuming case here, and um, does not lead the therapy or cannot be confirmed or can be confirmed with another approved method or device. So the, the second bullet point was kind of indicating that you do have available method for confirming that diagnostic diagnosis of that disease in question. So the regulation actually says confirmation by a medically established diagnostic procedure. So that as Sorry, I, by what? By? Medically established yep. diagnostic procedure. So I understand that Sanger is an analytically valid way to confirm it, but the question is whether or not that's, there's also the clinically valid piece. So it's, you know, is, that a, is it a medically established procedure to return results to healthy people for genetics? The, if what is the standard of care currently? What is the approved method currently? How you how you diagnose those patients? If you will re, uh, return those method the, those results from whatever that other method was, then you are confirming them before giving parent uh, uh, diagnosis. Correct, but you're not. That's not the only piece. It's not just an analytical confirmation. Medically established diagnostic procedure. So the question is, would you normally sequence a healthy person? I mean, there's an ethical piece um, that the ID regulations also compel us to consider the ethical piece to it as well in that medically established diagnostic procedure. So, so, yeah, I mean, I'm... No, yes, it is. No, the protocol is NGS, which is a National Children's Day Study. No. <laughs> I, I don't want to take more time from the others, but uh, that would be the method for um, confirming any IVD, such as you have another glucometer and you're confirming in healthy or diabetic people, you're just trying to confirm the blood glucose. So I don't see, the, well, and we did have examples, not with, with this sure. particular thing, but we did have examples in which if we are using to develop, and we are developing IVD, and those results might or might not be given to a patient, but before medical diagnosis is made or any kind of medical decision is made, will be confirmed with another medical approved procedure or device that your study will be exempt. I mean, we had that situation, so that's why I'm trying to understand why is this different. As I said, I, I think what, we, what we're trying to describe is that piece isn't just an analytical piece, it's the clinical validity as well. Um, and so, obviously, glucometer is indicated for people with diabetes, not for healthy people. So it's sort of the same thing. You wouldn't use a, you know, a glucometer on a healthy person. Um, obviously, we have procedures for evaluating gestational diabetes and other things. But, um, you know, 
that's our concern is obviously the use of sequencing in a healthy population where that's not right now a typical diagnostic procedure. So you're saying that, that we should, when we analyze those type of RBs, that we should be focusing or is it healthy people or healthy volunteers or uh, patient population, that that should make a difference uh, in that fourth criteria? Because you seem to be making that that is the reason why uh, example with development of glucometer would be different than this one. Because with glucometer, we presumably will um, um, recruit patients with diabetes while here we are generally screening. So healthy versus disease is the difference that we should go for? I think I can fill in the, the, the disconnect here. I think the, the problem is when you're talking about medically, medically relevant procedures, right? For a healthy individual, there's nothing that is necessarily a medically relevant procedure to, like normally healthy individuals don't have any treatment, have any, any, any standard treatment that's used on them. And so you're, you're basically saying that doing this sequencing, if you, do it, if you would normally do it in healthy individuals, that's one thing, but it's not normally done in healthy individuals, so it's not, uh, not the uh, standard of care for healthy individuals. And I think that's where the disconnect is. When it comes to the, the meeting the regulation in terms of, um, um, now I've lost the words again, um, medically established diagnostic procedure. I mean, I think you have to consider the study and who is in the study and whether or not that what you're doing in a study is a medically established diagnostic procedure for the people in your study. So I guess I, I heard the same theme coming back, um, and I think it was Jeff earlier in, in your conversation talking about its risk is not based on the device alone or on the trial alone, but on the combination of the two. And so that, I at least to me, I'm wondering, Kelly, if, if that gets to your point that it's um, that while they're Sanger sequencing, it's Sanger and healthy, and you wouldn't normally be testing these healthy individuals for these tests, and so there's still some risk that you all would perceive from that because of the population. Well, and that's why I'm saying it wouldn't meet the definition of exempt. Right. Which is actually what you're trying to. Well, I was just going to tell you um, how I thought of it. And I actually don't know if we're even, we are thinking of it quite the same way. But my my take on this, the saying are an exemption, because I think it's been different, say, in oncology, again, than in the sort of genomic study we're talking about, is um, that, you know, there may be certain variants for even rich four in a healthy population, you might know what the medical significance of that was. So BRCA and risk, right? I mean, that's something that, you know, saying, detecting that by saying or would, this, I would, I personally would consider that medic, you know, probably medically established. But you will be detecting many variants for which it's not, the reporting of that would not be a stand, those variants would not be standard for that population, right? So if you got a um, variant for, um, you know, in the CFTR2 gene, but you were healthy, maybe that's not really, the reporting of that is not medically established. So even if you confirm it analytically by saying, or, you don't have, you don't have any clinical meaning to that, and I, I don't know if that's exactly a true statement, but that's you know I'm just trying to think of an example off the top of my head. So I don't know if that's exactly what you're trying to say, Kelly, but you know that's how I've thought about. it. I guess it. it's similar. I mean, in, even BRCA one and two, we have a lot of information on on these in people with family history or who actually have disease. I mean, I still think you know we're we're getting a lot of information on what these mean in pe in, in healthy people that have no family history and no, no disease, and, and does it actually have the same level of risk? So I think you've got to be careful in those cases of saying um, it's always going to be the same for, for example, healthy population um, versus the fact that we know a lot more about it in people with, you know, strong family histories or people who already had breast cancer and, or, or other. So um, just to kind of put a slight 
twist on this, and I, I, maybe it comes out in a future case, so I apologize, but if, if, if instead of a healthy study population, you had a study population of, you know, kids with intellectual disability and undiagnosed diseases, those sorts of things, and in that setting right now, it is sort of established medical care to, to do exome sequencing. It's offered by clinical labs. It's been up, you know, taken up by a lot of physicians. So in that case, if you were looking at a clinical study with regard to exome sequencing in children with a likely genetic diagnosis, then maybe that wouldn't rise to the risk if what you're saying is that that would have been the standard medical test to do anyway. Would that be appropriate to say? I mean, I think that makes more sense. And obviously, we I don't know as much about what's going on in that field. Um, I mean, obviously, um, you know, we just wanted to hear about what you're doing with the results and, and all of that. And um, okay. yeah. Adult onset conditions to children who, let's say in the hypothetical that was just um, given, would, would that in and of itself affect your decision about risk level? I can tell you that we've struggled with that one. Um, and uh, we had a lot of discussion around that and involved, um, you know, ethicists to, to just to talk about it. Um, I realized that the ACMG recommendations actually didn't define age and they thought there was a benefit to children, but I still think the question is whether or not that's really, we understand that's recommendations and we're learning about that, that's emerging, but I guess the question is whether or not, um, I think I think that was one thing that we struggled with. So I, I can't say that that's black or white. So I guess this is. Example that, that you gave you the BRAC mutation and stuff is also something that we had, and that is, um, and we did have a little bit of that argument with um, other parties, like investigators, like, oh, but these are already diagnosed as a cancer patient, so we are not re-diagnosing them. But I see that difference as a little bit more subtle. Well, you didn't diagnose them with BRAC one positive whatever mutation, so that's a little bit uh, different. Um, I'm just trying to to now search and see. Yes, they were all cancer patients, none of them were healthy, although I can clearly see that a lot of uh, studies would simply have a control group, that, because you need to have a control group once in a while to, to, for glucometer or anything else. So th that I would make a distinction, at least from what we saw between your example and the one that was given here, um, with which process I'm not very familiar. And I, I think what I was going to have say in follow-up to actually all of this now that I think about it is, you know, how do we even define medically established? I mean, you know, in the example uh, you gave, Jonathan, there's, um, you know, certainly it is a common thing to do. Like in oncology, we have the advantage of having NCC and guidelines and, you know, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, professional guidelines that say exactly what you want to do in various scenarios. So it's pretty easy to decide what sort of standard care. Um, I'd say it's challenging here when we're sort of in the middle of uptake to say, well, what's really medically accepted? I mean, I would think that, um, you know, so I think that's why it can be hard to define right now because we're seeing this type of uh, transition. I mean, I expect at some point, say for your case with uh, whole exome for intellectual disability, at some point it will be standard of care. I mean, that's the way it's going. Uh, I don't know what date yet or when we would call that, but, um, you know, I think, you know, this is going to be a challenging conversation. So, and that actually goes to um, the second bullet. We, we had some other things we wanted to raise for discussion of things that, um, to think through, not to necessarily have an answer for, but to think through about whether or not some of these um, elements of the study that were added in to address risk, um, how they affected that, that determination or how they might um, be used in the consideration 
of risk. And so obviously we've talked about Sanger and now the group also came to this discussion about does the decision to return um, the ACMG 56 as a professional guideline um, at this point, how does that mitigate or affect risk determinations? And just that question I had as well of um, there are they are professional guidelines that are out there. I'm not sure at this point whether they are commonly considered to be um, clinical guidelines or standard of care, or if that's still a debate. Um, and um, so I, I think these are useful things um, to think about and, and do highlight some of the areas where um, it does come down to really looking at the individual cases we've, we've heard this morning um, from FDA. The other thing um, that we noted in the course of walking through the case as an issue that addressed potentially some of the risks posed by the return of results was to include a genetic counselor um, in those discussions with the patients. Um, and I know we, we often hear about that as, as being an answer because they can make sure that, that either physicians who are receiving results or patients who are receiving results have a, have a better shot, I guess I would say, at understanding um, the information. I, I just wondered again um, to ask our FDA colleagues, uh, you know, how subjective is that? Is it, is it still context specific? Um, how does that affect if someone is trying to decide, should we integrate genetic counseling into our protocol? What are the things to think about in terms of um, what it can add besides obviously the, the um, capacity of the genetic counselor to communicate and the knowledge that they would be able to convey? Well, I don't think that, I, I think genetic counseling is, um, obviously, we uh, think it's very important and we know a lot of the professional guidelines for a lot of the, um, you know, genetic testing actually states that you should include pre and post test counseling. Um, I think if, if you think about just the risk of NSR versus SR, I don't think that, you know, having genetic counseling would would change that risk, but I think that in terms of it, for example, um, um, adding to sort of the safety um, and, and that piece would actually just really help us, for example, in the IDE and, and approving it because there was that piece conveying the information. Um, and uh, I guess that's, those were my thoughts. Do you have anything else? No, I would simply agree that uh, having a genetic counselor involved would be a, a risk mitigator, but it wouldn't necessarily change the, the overall decision. Um, was there a question from the web or? Okay. Um, are there other questions or, or issues that we haven't highlighted that anyone, um, that this is raised for anybody or, or questions that um, anyone would like to discuss before we move on to a different case? One of the bullet points was um, pathogenic mutations are, are being returned. Uh, there was no discussion, obviously, you know, what is pathogenic in the terms of when you guys are looking at it, when the FDA is looking at, at what is being returned, do you have a cutoff that you all would prefer to use, or do you defer to the lab that's putting on the, that's doing the experiment, or doing the, the protocol, to decide what is likely pathogenic, what is highly pathogenic, you know, that 90 versus 95 percent question that, that uh, was talked about earlier? I haven't had uh, a protocol yet. Do we, do we have any? Not in the context of an IDE, but I think the way you know we've thought about that is you know show us how you're interpreting. It ought to be fairly, you know, the, the rules should make sense. You know, I mean, we certainly looked at that in the context of pre-market submissions for, you know, actual tests for marketing uh, where there would be uh, new variants that would be called and we, we've said, we've looked at the process of interpretation rather than the actual variants, but, you know, it's... The one uh, place where I know outside of just looking at this, this study like this, though, um, you know, we've had some new drug trials come through where they want... Um, 
you know, that a lot of these people who have conditions, the, you know, apparently, you know, many cases, these patients will have been sequenced for, with a, uh, a targeted panel, if you will. Um, and we do struggle there because often they want to leave it up to whatever lab they use. And that is problematic for the trial because labs can define them differently. And so you may actually have a problem with your trial if, for example, one lab treats one as benign and the other one, you know. So that's, that is a problem that we find is that with labs defining variants differently, especially when you want to use different uh, labs, their own targeted panels, and they can differ in their interpretation, it winds up causing problems in those kinds of trials. But then we, CEDAR, that's their problem, not ours. Okay. Okay, these are comments from the web. Um, someone's commented that um, when clinical labs report the ACMG recommended secondary findings, this is similar to returning results to a healthy population since these people are not symptomatic. Is there any comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I still think the concern here is the healthy study population and whether or not I mean, you normally would not, you know, ask to have them sequenced, right? Um, and so whether it's ACMG 56 or um, any results, I mean, that's not currently standard of care. Okay. And then um, a question from online was, to take the BRCA example, finding a known pathogenic variant in an infant might save the parents' lives. Standard of care dictates return and may benefit healthy child. Is this still significant risk and why? Well, I'll weigh in. <laughs> um, you know, I think the, it, you know, in the sense that if you had a incorrect result, you know, if we go back to the sort of core question of what are the consequences of an incorrect result, I, I would tend to be on the significant risk side that, you know, you don't want to falsely report a BRCA mutation um, because the, even the parents, well, well, I mean, you have the backup with the parents of they probably would get tested themselves. So that might mitigate it. Um, but, you know, certainly if that, it would depend on the workflow. But I, I do, you know, obviously we haven't encountered this before. And I think it brings up an interesting question in looking at risk. And it would be interesting to hear from IRBs and things like that about, you know, this is a situation where the testing impacts not just the patient, but it opens up the, you know, possibility of posing risk to other family members who may or may not have consented to be a part of this. And so I think um, that's, you know, an interesting aspect of this is what, you know, how far down the sort of path do you go of, uh, of causing, a, you know, of uh, people who may be sort of uh, peripherally involved initially who haven't consented to themselves be tested, but that the return of the result in a family member would possibly indicate that they may themselves have a condition. Okay, and this will be our last comment on this one, and then we'll move on to so the second. I'm not clear why there is so much emphasis on this false negative and false positive, because it's not a significant population you will have with the false negative and false positive, unless you say, okay, NGS is completely screwed up. You have 90% uh, false negative and false positive. But there is so much better answer you are going to get, and, but still, I'm not hearing those comments, but rather more on the false negative, false negative, false positive, false positive. And the other thing is for the trio design, why will it pose a significant risk? Because you did find a mutation in the child, and you are sort of like confirming whether the parents have it or not. So I'm still not clear why this will pose a significant risk here. We have to remember that we're considering here that the, the device is investigational. I mean, you've done some analytical validation, but it's not to the level of it being an FDA cleared or approved device where we would ask for extremely robust validation that means that 
we're fairly confident that it's accurate and reliable. So obviously, that is just a piece of it where the potential of false positive and false negative, that's, that's the question that's there in terms of risk. And one of the mid other mitigating factors that we review when your ID comes in is the analytical validation. I mean, obviously, if it turns out that your NGS pipeline is only correct 50% of the time, we actually may disapprove that IDE anyway. But, you know, so the accuracy winds up being a mitigating factor in the risk. But I think that's, you know, you almost have to assume that the investigational device will be wrong. What's the risk that happens to the people in the study when, when the answer is wrong? And that's how we are tasked to evaluate risk in a study. And then once it comes in, we evaluate accuracy, reliability, and then a lot of these other things, like the, the TRIO may actually help you once again. It may be a way to mitigate the risk of a false, negative, or false positive because it, you have that information. I mean, as long as obviously there's no found out question or issue of paternity, which apparently happens also a lot more often than people were expecting. Um, but, um, you know, I think those are all why it would potentially be mitigating factors. So, and I have to just remind you that significant risk doesn't mean that you can't do the study. It just means that you have to have an IDE that we are approving. And most of the time, you know, we're not making a significant change. You know, we may ask you, for example, for more information in your consent document or consider some vulnerable populations, but, um, you know, we're not trying to get anybody to change their study to avoid a significant risk determination. We just would need an IDE. Yeah, I would just reiterate that we, when making a risk determination, we do look at worst case scenario. Uh, we do worry about what, would, what could happen to anybody with a false result, false positive or false negative. Okay, so we are going to move on to the next case, which is very creatively called Protocol Y. Um, so in this particular scenario, we have um, a phase three clinical trial, 500 patients with relapsed colorectal adenocarcinoma. They're randomized to standard treatment versus targeted therapy arms. Um, based on the next-generation sequencing, tumor sequencing. There's an oncopanel analysis of both the tumor and the germline um, genomes in a CLIA-certified laboratory. The primary analysis um, for the tumors, they're analyzed for somatic variants that are targetable based on a literature search. There's also a secondary analysis component where germline variants known to predispose to inherited susceptibility to colon cancer um, will be assessed. As a primary outcome for the trial, um, those participants identified to have druggable somatic variants are treated with a therape the, um, particular therapeutic, and the survival time and or recurrence are compared to standard treatment. And a secondary outcome to be measured in this trial is that participants who receive molecular diagnostic reports of both the somatic and the germline variants, and those with germline variants will be offered genetic counseling. So this is our setup. And again, we'll just take the, the straw poll here and see um, from everyone um, our three categories of different options. If anyone thinks that this particular, um, if this were to come in for, for an um, IDE submission, whether or not it would be um, assessed to be um, actually first exempt from the IDE regulations? Or how about non-significant risk determination? Okay, and how about significant risk? Okay, and again, I hope everyone um, at home slash in the office is playing along um, on the web and keeping those things in mind as we start to walk through. Okay, so first thing to think about, of course, again, as um, before and as we've talked about all day, is what is the device here? Um, again, this would be next generation sequencing, um, the entire pipeline. We also have the onco panels that are looking um, specifically at um, particular genes. A difference in this proposed study design or this case is that NGS is standing on its own. There is not any orthogonal confirmation um, of any of the variants identified. Um, 
Another thing to keep in mind is the study population. Again, we've heard this morning about it's not just the device, but it's um, who um, and for what purpose the device is being used. And here we're talking about individuals with um, relapsed colorectal adenocarcinoma. So these are, um, this is not a diagnostic population, um, but these are folks who have relapsed. And so that can have issues to think about with regard to what is the standard of care for this population and what are the expectations for this population um, coming into um, the study. Um, again, thinking about um, what the, in, the um, investigators are looking for through this um, design, we have um, a case where we're looking at somatic variants, and that is dictating which therapy arm um, the participants will be directed into. And so um, this would be something, again, to think about with regard to something that was raised earlier. Um, that we heard about that, that makes a difference with regard to risk is what are the consequences then um, of those decisions. And again, coming back to what we've heard and, and talked about even last time, the emphasis on um, thinking about false positives and false negatives, especially when those um, different results can make a difference in terms of which direction a participant goes in terms of their participation in the study. Um, again, there's a, a return of results issue, just a basic return of results issue, um, thinking about looking at the germline variants and what that could mean, um, and the fact that um, if we thought about an example, if an individual was tested positive for Lynch syndrome in this case, what are the risks and responsibilities related to returning that information um, within the trial? Um, and again, thinking about what the consequences are for false positive or false negative with regard to this particular result. <laughs> Moving on to the secondary outcome, um, something else to think about um, is, again, also um, the fact that those that do receive the germline variant information will be offered um, genetic counseling. It will be a choice in this particular case. Um, and so that's something that we've already talked about is, is an issue um, that could be considered with regard to the overall trial and the overall um, ethics and, um, I guess, soundness of the study design when FDA is considering the, the IDE in particular, not necessarily about the risk itself. Okay, so um, with that, actually, before I put up the answer that we um, guessed. I wanted to invite the FDA um, participants on the panel to um, share their thoughts on whether or not that first question of, of this protocol would be non-significant risk or significant risk. Uh, well, I'd, I'd like to make a, a little more general point uh, that um, it, in this case we have uh, patients with recurrent colon cancer. and. Um, have, having recurrent or uh, incurable cancer, although that may be a, a risk mitigator, there are, there are for a variety of different tumor types, there are standard of care therapies for recurrence that do have some effectiveness, so that the fact that a patient has incurable cancer certainly does not automatically make it uh, NSR. So I guess... The drugs that are mentioned there, should we assume that they are FDA-approved drugs and we are just, uh, or there might be investigational drugs? In it. Okay. I think, so I'll speak to our assumption in writing this particular study design is that they were FDA-approved, but I think your point is incredibly important because that makes a big difference in terms of the layers of risk that are presented, and so that's a really valid point to be thinking about. Um, so. Again, just for the purposes of conversation, we've already heard um, from Jeff that, that it depends on the particular cancer type, that even having recurrent um, cancer or incurable cancer in and of itself um, doesn't change the implications in terms of, of different directions that participants might um, move through a study, and so it really is based on the standard of care for the particular um, disease in question. Um, 
So we, based on this one um, and some other information, we were thinking that this would be non-significant risk, but again, it, it will depend. Um, we'll go ahead and go to your question. Sure. Uh, sort of a point of clarity. Um, can, can you put back up the, the list? I'm sorry. Um, so when you say NGS tumor sequencing right in the very top bullet, I actually, in my head, combined that with the second bullet where it said oncopanel analysis. I was thinking when I first read this that you were talking about a targeted sequencing panel, and that was the only sequencing that was being done on these patients. But when you say NGS sequencing at the top, you're actually talking about like exome sequencing separate from a targeted cancer panel. Is that correct? It's, it's, it's a question, again, I think, as to what we're talking about. Or Rebecca, but Rebecca, as the author, wants to. <laughs> Okay, so you're saying that the only sequencing in this protocol is the onco panel. Then I would say that absolutely there's no risk. Why would there why would there be any risk if you're only if you're only subjecting camp, cancer patients to cancer related sequencing? Well, there could there could be risk if you're depriving some of them of standard of care, which uh, you are. You know, half the patients are they're randomized to standard of care, and the other half get something else. Okay, and so that's the other question I had was, so when you said randomized at the, at the start, so it doesn't matter what somatic variants you find in the patients that are randomized to the standard treatment, or, or are they not even being sequenced, basically? Because I, I think all, all these, little, these, these little things like that make a huge difference in, in the risk, and if it's not clear that the patients are being randomized and then only the, peop, only the patients in one uh, in the in the one arm are being sequenced and not the other one, then that makes a huge difference on, you know, if you find a, a targetable variant in a person who was randomized into the standard treatment, you should be using targeted treatment on that patient. That would be the standard of care at that point, right? Just going back to the question about oncopanel. So oncopanels can be NGS. Obviously, we, in, at the NCI, we do 470 genes. And those are, you know, it's, it's not as big as an exome, but it's still NGS. Right, right. So, so, so anyway, but just just go back, just going back to your low risk, uh, uh, not not significant risk assessment. Um, but what about the same question? If you you, you sequence, you're returning germline uh, uh, mutations, and as soon as you sequence the germline, you're in fact sequencing the family. So it's not, it's not. So what, what what's your comment about that in terms of risk? Do you not think, isn't, isn't the same rules apply to the first case, where in fact you are, you know, you're, you're in, you're, you are finding something that may be incidental or secondary that actually puts risk to the, to the family? Right. Just well, I think, yeah. da I think David addressed that a few minutes ago about the fact that there, there could be risk, risk to other people, family members. Um, j just to spark the discussion, uh, we again had that example, uh, and that's why I ask, are the drugs FDA approved or not, because we had a, each way you want in whole genomic uh, department is doing study like that. And um, when we submitted study, um, very similar to this, drugs were approved, of course, panel that they were testing is uh, novel and couldn't be confirmed with anything else. Uh, it was deemed significant risk, which we assumed, and for the reason that you just mentioned, and which I want to just underline, and that is that pa some patients, even if the drug is approved, first line of therapy was cisplatin, and second line of therapy was something else, so you might be depriving some patients of first line of therapy by randomizing them based on then their genomic profile that could not be confirmed with, with uh, anything else currently available. Right, and I would point out that when you say a a drug is approved, it has to be approved for that intended use. Yes. No, no. In this case, it was non-FDA approved drug whatsoever. It couldn't fit exemption criteria. Um, so on the second bullet, are you offering people the opportunity to opt out of the germline results? And if so, are they being offered genetic counseling before they make that decision? Because I think that definitely affects the risk. Um, so I think that you're right that that would affect the risk, and I'm going to let FDA talk about that. But I'm going to say we didn't think about that, so we were not in this imaginary scenario, had not contemplated that. Um, so I don't know, Kelly, if, if you had a comment, but if not, I have another reaction to. 
Well, if I recall from the bullets, it actually said the germline sequencing was only of uh, variants that would make you susceptible to color, right? So it's not the full panel. Um, and I guess it all depends. I mean, I would get your protocol, and if it, for example, had opt-outs. But, you know, we're looking at the worst-case scenario. So, I mean, I think that depending on the information you provided, I mean, if it was standard of care for people with colorectal cancer to have, you know, assessments of germline for, I mean, that's the question I would have for you is, because I'm not in the, I don't, I don't do the oncology things, for example, very much. I don't at all. Um, but obviously, if, you know, you provide us information that, and, you know, not just your site, but many, that this was standard of care, I mean, that would be information that would help us assess the risk. Um, so I also hadn't remembered to, to flash up here. We, we did also have some points in here that we had integrated that, um, to try and address um, the management for some of the risks. So again, thinking about the study population that, that this affected it, that it was not, that it was relapse cancer. We had been assuming um, that, that the standard of care was no better than the other things in this particular scenario. But again, that's not going to be true in all cases. Um, and then again, the addition of the option for genetic counseling for the germline um, variants. The reaction that I, I wanted to raise, um, and just because it's it struck me, is that all of these different questions that now you all are posing back to ourselves as we think through this um, are the same kinds of things that, um, as we've been talking to FDA over the past few months, constantly come up um, in terms of all of the what ifs. Well, what if this particular issue is changed or what if this particular situation is present and why um, I think it in this situation um, the details really matter and all of these different caveats of, of different um, experimental designs, different scenarios of your study population, different um, implications in different populations of what the device is going to tell you um, really make some, some big differences. And even the typical things or what we thought were typical that you could do to try to mitigate risk still um, are context specific. And so it is complicated to think through um, in the absence of specific information. And so, again, well, um, I hope not too many of you, but some of you may be frustrated that, you know, we're not getting precise, clear-cut, black and white answers in some of these cases. I think it is helping us this thought, to go through this thought exercise and think about all of the different ways that we can identify how we could change a scenario and what the implications might be um, of those changes. So um, I want to, before we move on, um, we're, we're making pretty good track to get to the next one right on time, but I think we have some online comments or questions for this one. Yes, yeah, so um, don't shoot the messenger, please. <laughs> <laughs> but. Um, so any remain, there's a comment that says any remaining risks resides with the de determination of pathogenicity for a variant that is the practice of medicine and not a function of the device. Um, I feel I need to represent our web viewers. Input. Yes, no, I think that's a... Do we have reactions to that? Or thoughts from the audience as well on, on that point. Well, that actually kind of raises uh, a point that came up in our lab meeting uh, last week. I'm in Les B Seekers lab, as I talked about earlier, and um, he and our uh, lab manager were, or the one of our uh, people in the lab that does a lot of the sequencing for. Uh, the confirmation sequencing for the exome results that we get back. Um, they were arguing back and forth about whether returning a, a specific result was um, made any sense. And basically, it came down to less the uh, you know the MD was saying statistically it there's there's little risk there. And our um, scientist who was who was uh, actually doing the confirmation was saying, I don't care how little risk there is, there is risk, I don't want to return this. And that's, that's sort of where, like, it, it's, it's an interesting, like, difference between the way that, that people in the medical profession versus research scientists think about things. I obviously think that you just need to think about how you're defining things. I mean, because you're going to be, you know, it's a study, and you're obviously 
have endpoints in mind that you want to see what the outcomes are. Um, you know, in many cases, you know, what we're asking, for example, in IDE is how you're defining these things. Um, and obviously making sure that at least they make sense. And we rely a little, you know, mostly on, in this case, probably some of the definitions that are out there. And, and so you would obviously have to make the argument as to why you're defining pathogenic in that way or likely and all those things. Um, and then, I mean, it, in part in a lot of these studies, I mean, those things are being evaluated since I think that it still is a little bit of a, you know, um, highly dependent on the person who's doing it. Um, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how that comes out in your study. But I don't know if we necessarily tell people how to, to change those things. What we are asking is obviously it's probably in your best interest to define how you're going to put variants in those bins in a consistent manner and that that makes sense. Um, and then, you know, that would probably be evaluated in your study. You're going to see how that falls out in the end. Okay, so I, I think Kelly may have just gotten to um, a point that I was just thinking about um, as sort of it's, it's, again, not an answer for today, but a place where I think we have continued dialogue to have and discussion about um, this gray zone, not a gray zone, but this transition that we have as we're learning knowledge and, and the, um, Jonathan talked about it as well earlier, where the, you quickly get into cl the clinical validity issues and the practice of medicine. And these are not automated procedures with clear-cut answers at this point. There's a lot of interpretation that's going on um, and that needs to go on as we try to learn through this. And so I was wondering, you know, how do we continue this dialogue um, with the FDA from the research community to work through this time frame as we, as we learn and, and what are constructive thoughts that anyone has on, on how best to do that. And I think, Kelly, you were pointing to the fact that um, something we've heard before is that just because there's significant risk doesn't mean it can't go forward and that in the IDE um, submission what we're looking for is what are the parameters that you as the um, researcher or the clinical researcher who may be um, doing some practice of medicine in the context of your research study to answer some questions, um, being specific about how you plan to interpret things um, so that FDA can see what that is. Is that a fair? Um, now, I can repeat that and know that I'm not a clinician and I don't actually know how much you can put that out in advance, and I think that's something else that I've, I've heard um, that sometimes is, is hard to say. Um, how concrete can you be up front about those things? So just to kind of this, um, comment on the, the issue that just because you have to submit an ID doesn't mean you can't go forward with research, right? That, and, and that's an important point. But there's also a substantial amount of burden associated with that for a, a researcher. And so the, you know, sort of cost-benefit analysis of, you know, what would be the harm of having IRBs oversee this, and what do we gain by having the FDA oversee it, you know, and sort of how do we balance that, that need? Um, because, yes, you can go ahead and, and do your research. You just have to have an IDE, but that means different reporting structures, it means having to, you know, sort of be locked into a specific protocol and if there's changes to make notifications and, and so forth. So it, it isn't a completely insignificant additional regulatory burden on researchers. I can only, you know, as I said, when these regulations were written 40 years ago, um, you know, the decision by Congress and the people who were writing the regulations was, was that if if studies met this bar, that it was important for the FDA to review them and weigh in on safety. Um, so, I mean, I think that we understand that, um, and, and I think that's why even, uh, you know, David's talk talked about how research and IDs used to be here and now they're here. Um, and uh, so we are trying our best to, you know, especially be here and, um, you know, help as much as we can. Um, you know, now that we find a lot more of the research is actually intersecting with how the regulations were written 40 years ago. Another point that I'd like to raise, kind of jumping off the previous comment, is are we at all concerned about the chilling effect that IDEs might have on genomic research in terms of building some of the evidence base that we need to more accurately determine risk? 
how people are impacted over the long term, psychosocial income or outcomes and things like that. Are we worried about researchers who might be discouraged from doing re the research that we need to gather the data to assess risk? Just a point for comment. We acknowledge that and we hear that about all forms of FDA regulation. Um, and all we can speak to is obviously the mission that we have, um, the regulations that we're um, tasked to follow, um, and that we're providing obviously um, you know, some evaluation of safety for studies, safety and effectiveness for devices. Um, and obviously we've heard that also you know, with regards to you know, the, the discussion about regulating LDTs. Um, so, I mean, we hear both sides. Um, we obviously, as we said, we've tried to, to point to how our timelines, we're trying to move forward as quick as we can, uh, interact with people as quickly as we can so we can move forward with a decision and not hold things up. Uh, you know, that's obviously not our intent, but our, our, our side is actually to look at the safety of the participants, and that's what we're tasked to do. Um, and, and obviously, you know, innovation, in some cases, it's safe. In some cases, it's not. And that's where we're sort of the watchdog for that. OK. Um, so we're going to move on now to our next um, protocol, which has even more questions and open-ended um, paths we could go down than the first two. Um, so and again, cleverly called Protocol Z as we move forward. So in this particular case, we have a large 800,000 person nationwide cohort for a longitudinal study um, going forward. The cohort includes individuals recruited directly from healthcare provider networks and healthcare systems, um, pharmacogenomic arrays, as well as exome sequencing um, through next generation sequencing platforms um, will be performed um, in CLIA certified laboratories. Participants may download uninterpreted sequence data um, to look at if they wish to look at the information. Um, incidental findings will be reported according to the ACMG 56 as the, gui the guiding principle. Sequence data will be deposited in electronic health records and will be shared with providers upon participants' requests, though I would have to say if it's in their electronic health record, those um, they're going to, to see it. So perhaps um, this one was that if participants agree, the information will be um, deposited into their electronic health record. Um, in addition, a resource will be created so that de-identified individual level data can be accessible to secondary investigators. Um, through a controlled access process to do additional analyses um, on the accumulated and generated data. These secondary investigators may also return individual level results um, to the participants who will be able to have access to them if they would like. Okay, and that's as complicated as we got. So, who wants to say exempt for this one? <laughs> Um, Non-significant risk, significant risk, okay, see we're coming together, we're starting to <laughs> agree on some things. I have a quick question, sure. what's, what's the primary outcome? What's the primary analysis? Who's doing the primary analysis? What's the end point? The end point is the resource. I'm going to start interpolating here. So it is to create a resource and to follow these people over time and to see what is possible to be learned by connecting the, all of the data that can be collected, a genomic, otherwise looking at their health outcomes. So, it is to create a resource and follow people long term and, and um, generate hypotheses that can be examined. OK. Um, so first question that we've talked about before. What is the device here? I have another question. How many devices might be embedded within this particular? I think you'd end up as, with as many devices as there are um, CLIA certified labs that are doing the, the sequencing, basically. Like if you're, whoever's, whoever's doing the pharmacogen pharmacogenetics array and the NGS sequencing for that specific individual, 
would be would they would have their device and they might have a cohort of a hundred thousand of those eight hundred thousand, but that would be a device and then another all the different labs would have to be a separate device, correct? Does anyone from FDA want to I actually have a follow-up to add on to that for uh, some of the FDA folks to ask if then all of those secondary investigators who might be doing follow-up analysis there, would that also be included in the device or be a separate device? Yeah, I think, I think the hard thing is obviously the, any additional, I think the hard thing here is that it's almost impossible to assess risk because you're not, there's so many unknown risks here. I mean, generally, you know, the way that we do is we need to have some quantifiable risk. And I think the difficult thing is when you have almost unlimited risk. <laughs> <laughs> it's significant risk. <laughs> uh, um, so, and then obviously, I mean, the, the issue is, and I think, uh, you know, the secondary uh, analyses themselves would each have to be individually assessed going forward. Because I think in some cases, maybe they would be NSR. In some cases, they may be SR. Um, even, you know, as part of a significant risk study, you can still probably have an arm that's like that. Never seen it. This is creative. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the interesting thing is, um, you know, and I, and I noticed one of your bullets even was, for example, allowing that, that the actual data itself was... Uh, not an issue or not a result, but I think, you know, if it's an investigational device, um, you know, just letting somebody download their DNA, the question still is, um, you know, how well validated that is. The analytical validity piece is still important because if somebody downloads it and takes it for truth and takes it and does their own, own analysis, I mean, that's still in, in question there, um, you know, without knowing how well it's been analytically validated. But I don't know if anybody else has questions or comments. So as um, we counted it at NHGRI, we, we did um, similarly come to at least two as the answer to the devices for the pharmacogenomics um, arrays and the exome sequencing. Um, and then we also, in thinking about the secondary investigators, um, especially as I listened to it this morning, I was thinking that they, um, depending on their analyses and, and again, assuming the intent to return the information um, to participants, um, that they would be individual devices, um, but that perhaps to simplify trying to submit um, the information, a master file could be created on the core information and all of the analytic val um, validation data for how this, this, the pharmacogenomic information and the exome information were generated so that that could be something that secondary investigators could just refer back to and then only need to talk about what they were doing um, in their individual um, laboratories, at least confining um, the types of things that they might have to do. So that, again, my hypothesis um, on that. Is, is that a reasonable way to think about the use of a master file? Or I can't say for sure, but I'm not sure that uh, a master file can be used by, those, by people other than those who actually submitted it. Well, if they get permission. Okay. You know, we always accept uh, right of reference letters from the original creator of the file to allow other people to refer to it. Okay. Okay. Um, also, thinking about the fact that these were um, individuals recruited um, in large numbers through their healthcare provider networks. Um, asking a question, and this is just a question, if increasing, um, as I'm trying to look at the notes, um, if increasing the number of people in the cohort increases risk, um, and what does it matter if the cohort is composed of individuals with very diverse health statuses? So we've talked before about healthy versus um, individuals or, or populations with a disorder, and here we're going to have um, a recruitment mechanism that's not based on that, and we assume if you recruit this many people, we all have something um, that's not quite healthy um, going on. And so how would you think about the risk 
um, here. And again, I don't know if this goes back to Kelly's comment earlier about if there's, you know, infinite ways to think about the risk. Is it just significant risk, or I don't know, Jeff, if you'd like to. Well, just as far as the number of uh, people in the trial, as I mentioned in my talk, um, we don't look at the numbers. So if there's one patient, I mean, there is such a thing as a one-person IDE. I mean, I think the problem with, um, as you said, I mean, yes, it's going to be people, all sorts of different problems. I mean, obviously, though, then you're not, you know, this study obviously isn't, for example, um, focused to answer a question that would help that population or, um, um, you know, that where something might become NSR because it's, you know, if we know the oncology one is a little bit easier in terms of, um, you know, the, the risks in that group, you can define them very well. And I think the problem is obviously here not really being able to define um, one specific risk and, and assess it. It's just, there's, it's unlimited. So I have a two questions. I have two questions. So that when a patient is in a stage four or a stage three cancer, insurance company does cover the genomic sequencing or NGS. So you can use a targeted therapy. So in those cases, I mean, their data is available in electronic record. So do they have to get or they already have IDEs or how exactly happens there? So IDE is for an investigation or trial. Um, if you're actually not in a study, you know, but if a test is being offered and it's an LDT, I mean, right now, um, you know, and if it's validated, mm -hmm. you know, and, and not investigational, where it needs an IDE, then, you know, right now the FDA has been, um, you know, there's been enforcement discretion for pre-market review. So that's the difference. I mean, we're, what we've been talking about today is investigation. So trials, you know, we're asking questions. Um, versus when, you know, a test is offered and used by a physician that's a laboratory-developed test, not in trial. So it means uh, the NCI recently has launched this MATCH trial. If people are aware, or let me go back a little bit, when NCI and NHGRI started this TCGA study where, like, they sequenced thousands of patients, and the first one was uh, glioblastoma, and they found, okay, these are the targets, and then, okay, it is giving to the scientific community. There are those targets. You can develop thera targeted therapies or therapeutic intervention. So they, do they also classify in the IDE category or not? I'm Tracy Lively from NCI, and there were, there were two very significant differences between the TCGA study, where the specimens were de-identified and no information was transmitted back to the people who donated the tissue. So it's purely research, no clinical uh, significance whatsoever to the individuals who donated the tissue. For the MATCH trial, of course, the information is transmitted back to the person to let them know whether they're eligible. And we went through an extensive consultation with CDRH. Um, it was actually uh, determined to be an NSR, but it is being conducted under abbreviated IDE with very extensive uh, monitoring, um, very extensive characterization of the analytical pipeline that we're using to do the sequencing. Um, we, we had to do a lot of work, even under an abbreviated IDE, to demonstrate that, um, for instance, all four labs that are doing the sequencing um, are as concordant as it is humanly possible to be, so that any specimen that goes to any one of those four labs is going to return the same result for that patient. Um, so those are two very different research projects. Yeah. So if you're NSR, then there's abbreviated IDE documentation. That's so an abbreviated IDE is just if you're NSR, you have to, I believe, was it Paul? I forgot who slides. So there's labeling requirements. There's still um, documents that you have to keep um, abreast of. But if you look in the regulation, it actually says if you're NSR and abbreviated, then you know these three things you still need to keep. But you don't come into FDA. You don't have an IDE. 
you're not providing those documents to FDA, but the idea is that you should have them on hand. Okay, so we have just a few minutes left, and so I'm going to go through a couple other points, but just wanted to um, jog our online viewers to see if, um, you, if you do have any questions or comments that you'd like to make, to please go ahead and um, send them in, and we have a couple more minutes, and we can try to get to them. Um, so again, I think we've covered um, the discussion of some of these issues in terms of places where um, clear risk is, is introduced, potentially. Um, thinking about the fact that participants can um, download uninterpreted sequence data, so um, you know, and and do then with it what they might, um, which is something that again, from an ethics perspective, as Sarah mentioned, um, that is becoming a norm in terms of thinking about the participants' right to their information, and so study designs like this. Um, yeah, no, that's not exactly what you said, but <laughs> don't worry, I don't mean to put words in your mouth. But I mean, this, this, um, the interest um, from participants to receive their data and to not have a gatekeeper or feel the need to have a gatekeeper if, if they would like to get it in uninterpreted ways is something that is um, going on and an active conversation and dialogue in the community. Um, and so, but thinking about that from the, the, IDE perspective as we go forward, um, and the, the risks and responsibilities, again, to um, address or manage some of those risks. Um, and then, of course, depositing it into um, the EHR so that it can be shared, um, again, assuming participant um, consent to share it with their providers through their EHRs, um, and what are the responsibilities or implications, even, of doing this. Um, in terms of thinking about um, the risk to participants part in, in this particular study. Um, I can think of lots of things um, that would come up that, that may not be um, typical, but are things that we at NHGRI think a lot about in terms of just even providers knowing what to do with the information and are there risks from providers having information that they don't know what to do with or doing the wrong thing with the information because they don't know what to make of it. Um, and how do we, again, integrate all of those particular issues into um, how the study might be able to go forward. Um, we've already talked about ACMG guidelines and, and how to interpret or, or I guess the different ways to navigate that question, I'll just say. Um, and then we mentioned earlier this, um, and already raised this issue about um, secondary investigators having um, the ability to, um, through controlled access, have access to the data resource that is created through this study, um, conduct secondary analyses, and also return those secondary analyses directly to um, participants. So I, I think there's a, an issue with those two bullets in that you're saying that the information is de-identified. So yeah. how would they return individual level results? If they found them to the participants, I mean, you can. So uh, I, I think in this for this study to work, it's not de-identified. I mean, the the right. investigator, so it's de-identified, and that secondary investigators will not know that this is Laura Rodriguez's information, mm -hmm. but would have a unique identifier and a link, so that the information could come back into my file somewhere, so that I could see it. Okay. So I mean, this actually raised a question I hadn't even thought about before, which is this idea of patients having access to their raw data. And would it be accurate to say that any study that gave participants access to their raw data would be a significant risk study? It's unlimited risk, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> you cannot possibly, uh, I mean, for, for an 800,000 person study, how would you possibly monitor the adverse events of that. I mean, I think that's where we would have to find out a lot from you about how well you've analytically validated it and all the information you're providing. And, and I think I, I don't want to assume that would be significant risk, but I think we would just have lots of questions. Um, and that's, you know, where you could assume, come in and tell us about what you've assume done. Assume that the, the analytic validity was perfect and you were giving the research participant a, a BAM file of, perfectly called variants or whatever. 
So if the data was perfect. If the data was perfect <laughs> and, they, and it was just free access to their personal genomic data, is that a significant risk study? No, uninterpreted, just raw variant calls, perfect variant calls, analytically perfect. Well, if, it were, if the data were perfect, then the IDE would be easily approved and you wouldn't have to worry about it. <laughs> but you'd still have to get an IDE. It would be a significant risk study. I'm just trying to clarify here. I don't know. Do we have to gnaw on that one for a little bit? Please do. <laughs> This is exactly. Well, I do think there is this question of whether, um, you know, I mean, this data has no clinical meaning associated with it. It's not interpreted. Um, so I, I think I, this is one of those things that would. I am sure if it came in in a pre-sub would provoke a very heated discussion. Um, but I do think um, this is one of those areas where we have to work to develop a risk approach. We have not faced this situation before. Um, and I'm thinking of also the, the for DTC companies, the ability to return things like, you know, uh, results that aren't, you know, basically aren't interpreted or have, you know, including you know, I mean, I think you could go either way on this because you could say it's significant risk because a patient could go somewhere and get it interpreted and then make a decision. But on the other hand, it's, you know, the variant list in and of itself or even the raw data file that they can go learn bioinformatics and get interpreted may not have any diagnostic meaning in and of itself. So I think that's one of those things where, you know, we fortunately have not had to decide that yet. But, so. Well, and I think, you know, it's another place that I can think of. It's hard for me, and, and I see a lot of risks depending on, for example, which, even which variant they're looking at and for what. So, um, you know, I do worry because a lot of cases, you know, if people get a DNA file, I mean, I'm just going to say that no, no DNA testing right now is perfect, 100% accurate. But... So in many cases, someone's not going to go out and, and redo it unless they actually find out something is wrong, and by then something's happened and gone wrong. So maybe they actually think that they are, um, you know, perfectly normal in terms of a drug metabolism by, you know, this DNA, and it turns out that it's wrong, and they wind up being put on that drug, and something goes horribly wrong. And so I, I think sometimes the hard thing with us is that, um, you know, when you're talking about being able to value anywhere, anything where there's no phenotype associated with it, and the problem is, is that you won't find out it's wrong until you have a phenotype and, and something does go wrong. So I think that's where, D, you know, as Steve had said, I think it'd be a really interesting discussion because I think that's where we struggle where, you know, these kinds of studies have that question that will be there that someone may actually, you know, their DNA testing might be wrong and maybe they have a BRCA1 variant or the fact is that science changes and they may not come back to it um, and they are moving forward with life with some you know, wrong information um, in their minds, either because the DNA testing sequence is wrong or because their interpretation was wrong. So, I don't know. So, I know that what the, at the NCI, when you're going back to your question, when patients, some patients have said to me, look, can we have our uh, exome data and we want Vogelstein's group to analyze it. In that case, we just ask our IRB and in most cases, they give permission. They say the patient has a right to their own data and we just give it to them because, with our IRB's approval. So we're going to have that be the last comment because we are five minutes over, and I know we have some of our speakers left this afternoon that need to, to get out of here. So I guess I'll, I'll just close, and I don't mean this to be on a negative note, but a challenge for us to think about, and in particular with, with this one, is we have a situation where we've talked about there's unlimited risk posed that's hard to think about. And when we're thinking about, as I heard a couple of times, um, our FDA colleagues come back to you in this thing that, that what you all think about is the worst case scenario and that's what you're trying to allow for in the IDE submission and, and make founders for. And again, I think here, the worst case scenarios in an 800,000 person study, the, the opportunities for that are, are rampant. And so it is something that will, will be interesting and fun to think through um, should something like this come to you. 
All right, thank you all, and thank you all for bearing with us through this, this thought exercise, which I know was, was very far-reaching and open-ended, but I hope helpful. As my staff unfortunately knows, I love a good pun, and uh, we have some speakers who face the significant risk of DC traffic, so <laughs> that's where we're moving into. Um, session five is steps after determining risk, and we have Dr. Yelena Berglund, who serves as Director of Re Regulatory Affairs and Head of Regulatory Training at the Duke Translational Medicine Institute, and you provide regulatory guidance and support to PIs and other members of the research community in determining regulatory requirements relevant to their study activities, and we appreciate you for coming today.